I'm joined now by Jason Matheny, founder of New Harvest, a nonprofit research institute that supports research for artificial meat. Jason, this is flesh created in a lab. What is it going to taste like? Well, it, it should taste the same as conventional meat because it's made out of the same stuff. Uh, so if we look at the way that our chicken nuggets and our hamburger is produced now, we think we can match that, that same taste and texture by producing meat in culture in a way that's much safer, much more efficient, and much healthier for the consumer. But right now, we can only grow very small amounts. Uh, so producing it at a large scale uh, is still uh, quite a technical challenge. So it's meat that is produced efficiently. What are the other potential benefits? Uh, well, one of the main ones is the environmental benefit. So some work that we're doing right now at Oxford University suggests that we could reduce by more than 80% uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from meat production by producing meat in vitro in culture. Another great benefit is uh, the public health potential of cultured meat. So right now we suffer very high rates of cardiovascular disease due to the amount of animal fat that we take in from our meat. Uh, in cultured meat, you can precisely control the amount of fat. So you could have more of the healthy fats like omega-3 um, and less of the unhealthy fats. So we could have hamburgers that actually prevent heart attacks rather than cause them. But you know what, the yuck factor in all this is, is pretty high. So how do you convince people out there, including me, to give it a shot? Well, we think that the, the yuck factor should really be associated with conventional meat because this is meat that's, in general, uh, typically unhealthy. Uh, we have half of our uh, chicken contaminated with salmonella or campylobacter, according to a recent consumer report study. Uh, we have uh, increased risk of E. coli. Uh, we have problems like swine flu and avian flu. The, the yuck factor should really be focused on conventional meat and the way it's produced right now, which is simply unhealthy, unsafe, and unsustainable. I would have to know how it was made. You start out with an individual cell and then multiply that cell in this large tank until you have many, many cells uh, that you then continue to grow until they form tissues. So it's the, it's the same stuff that's in the meat we eat now. Why do you think this is necessary? Meat causes millions of deaths each year due to cardiovascular disease. It contributes uh, more carbon emissions uh, to global climate change than the entire transportation sector. Can they guarantee with all certainty that this is going to be safe to eat? We could grow our meat in conditions that wouldn't produce uh, new uh, pathogenic strains of influenza because you wouldn't have live animals that are living in, in their own waste. I can't imagine that they could come up with an answer for growing meat in a laboratory that would solve the issue of, of hunger on the planet. We already have a problem uh, growing uh, meat for, um, for 6 billion people, producing meat for 9 billion people, as there will be soon in a few decades, is simply not sustainable. Possible without damaging the stock. This will help prevent any funguses from developing. Once removed, work as quickly as possible. First remove most of the larger leaves, leaving only two or three nodes or sets of leaves. Then cut the stem at a 45 degree angle, leaving enough stem to insert into the rooter. Dip it as quickly as possible into the gel to prevent air from getting into the stem. This is known as embolism. Insert the stem until it stops. Now we place our tray in the heat mat and insert the thermometer from our heat mat thermostat into the rooting area. Now, place it in the plug, making sure it is at least one quarter inch from the bottom of the plug. Place it in the tray and repeat.
of thing. It, it, it grows in water, okay? No soil. There's no soil in There's here? There's no soil at all. Okay. And if you lift that up, and then I'm just going to lift the little gizmo up here a little bit, and you can see wow. bare naked roots, so to speak. Shh, don't say that. <coughs> okay. We, we didn't mean that. <laughs> okay. Um, the other thing is, when do I water it? Well, yeah. this little guy's got a light that goes on if the water gets too low. Okay. When do I feed it? You know, give the fertilizer. It's yeah. got a little light that goes on. And here's how simple the fertilizing is. Uh, you take two little tablets. Oh, they're like little They're, they're yeah. like little old Alka-Seltzers, I guess. Yes. Two little tablets okay. like that. Mm -hmm. You just lift up its little mouth. You throw one in there, one in there. That's it? This That's was started it. just uh, about two weeks ago. These are cucumbers. Here at AeroGrow International Headquarters in Boulder, we get a sneak peek at prototypes and learn how the Aero Garden works. These pre-seeded pods are exposed to grow lights, and as the plant matures... The roots are suspended in air, and then down into a nutrient solution. Because they're suspended in air, they actually take up oxygen out of the air, kind of like our lungs do, and they grow much faster as a result. The system is totally automated, and everything from flowers to herbs, strawberries to tomatoes will grow in your home year-round. They taste great, and there's nothing like a vine-ripened tomato in January. Right now, people are just so disconnected from their food that the notion of being able to grow their own food indoors, worry-free, year-round, is, is such a huge concept that I think we really are just beginning. I had no idea that this would grow so fast. Since and plugging in the Aero Garden, Katie has only added water and nutrient tablets. Okay. Maintenance-wise, it was very... I can have it on top of a building in New York. I can have it in the desert in Las Vegas. I can have it out in the desert in Dubai. I can have it uh, in a building. Uh, I can have it in a basement by adding supplemental light. Uh, I can grow it anywhere. I can put it in the Arctic, okay? I can put it anywhere you want it. And I can produce large quantities of quality material. Potatoes, carrots, beets. Uh, about the only thing that, that we w would be limited on are large grain crops like wheat or corn, something like that. Uh, we're working on a rice project right now where we can grow rice in the system. Uh, we have strawberries. Uh, herbs of all varieties, lettuce, uh, spinach, uh, the, the crop list just goes on and on and on. Year-round production because we're in a controlled environment and the controlled environment offers us a number of other advantages. One, we can exclude pests so we have to use no pesticides to control insects on this material. Uh, of course because of the way it's grown uh, we don't have any weed crops, I mean weeds get in so we have no pesticides. Uh, the filtration system includes UV sterilization, so when the nutrients in the water are applied, they're completely clean. So we've eliminated that risk of E. coli contamination that we saw last year, uh, where you know I think five people died during that process. So that's one of the things we're trying to get to: is very clean, locally grown crops that are very healthy for you. So people would want to do it instead of having to be forced to do it. And sure enough, from the one simple house in, in South LA, everyone could see that, oh, this is easy. People will do it. And in fact, people want to do it. The curb lays exposes maximum surface area to the air which means not only can the helix harness a breeze from any direction, it takes less wind this to produce This in turn the allows the helix to be installed at lower heights than other turbines, making it safer, simpler, and less expensive to install. The sun beating down, scorching the earth. This research facility is trying to harness those relentless rays. You're saying this is the basically the, the coming out party of solar energy? I hope so. I really hope so.
Professor David Feynman has been working for 30 years and finally has found the breakthrough he's been waiting for. He's built a new, tiny solar panel that holds unprecedented amounts of heat and transforms it into electricity. Using this dish, essentially a giant mirror, he concentrated the light of a thousand suns onto the new panel. The result was staggering. So these ones here produce one watt. One watt each, yes. This, and this one, 1,500. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing, isn't it? What it really means, he says, is that solar energy can now compete with traditional energy sources on a large scale. Building a series of dishes concentrating light onto these tiny panels, Feynman says he would need just 12 square kilometers to create 1,000 megawatts of energy at competitive cost. This has dramatically changed the landscape of solar energy. Once a bit player, now a realistic, viable, pollution-free alternative to conventional energy sources. Experts say with projects like this, solar energy has truly arrived on the scene.